Welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. Today we're going to talk about E2 elimination reactions. But before we get into that, let's go through the practice problems I assigned last lecture. So in this question, I give you a carboxylic acid and I tell you it's treated with silver oxide. I asked what byproducts form, uh, what does the product look like, and by what mechanism does the reaction occur? So the product of this reaction is this uh, lactone here. A lactone is just a cyclic ester, and because the ester is contained within a ring, this is a lactone. The byproducts are silver bromide and water. And let me show you why that is. So first we take the carboxylic acid, we treat it with silver oxide, and the oxide is a base, so it deprotonates the H of the carboxylic acid. Now that we have a carboxylate, carboxylates are good nucleophiles. In the presence of silver, coordination to the bromide uh, makes it an even better leaving group, and the oxygen can attack at that position, displacing the bromide, forming the lactone product. The water is formed through the deprotonation of the carboxylic acid. Because only one equivalent, uh, because only one silver is required for this reaction, 0.5 equivalents of silver oxide are used. And so we'll initially get hydroxide, but when this hydroxide uh, will go and react with uh, another molecule, so ultimately water would be formed. Um, and then with silver bromide, same thing. Just silver bromide forms because there's only one silver really being used. Okay. So uh, for the second problem, I gave you this structure and I asked, uh, what are possible ways you could make this? So the most straightforward way that I've taught you guys so far would be to take this phosphite, which would be this tris trifluoroethyl phosphite. We use the word tris. Sometimes we'll say bis when there's two things, tris when there's three things. And if there's four or more, it would be tetricus, pentacus, hexacus, etc. And so we use that when we have tris right before uh, another thing with three. So because it's trifluoroethyl, we wouldn't say tri trifluoroethyl because that's a little bit confusing. So we say tris trifluoroethyl to indicate that we're talking about three things that happen to, happen to have multiples as well. Um, this type of nomenclature is more common in inorganic chemistry. Okay, so we have this iodide, this phosphorus could attack. The iodide would then attack at one of these positions, make iodo trifluoroethane as a byproduct, affording this product. Okay, before we get started into the main material, let me tell you about a few more reagents. So this first reagent here is DCC, dicyclohexyl carbodiimide. This is used as an amide and carboxylic acid, uh, an amine and carboxylic acid coupling reagent to prepare amides. So this is used for peptide synthesis, for instance, but it's widely used in organic chemistry. This essentially just absorbs an equivalent of water. And when we talk about the synthesis of esters and amides uh, in a subsequent video, we can get into why that is. Okay, this reagent here is called dyad. It's a versatile reagent. It's quite often used in a reaction called the Mitsunobu reaction, um, although it has other chemical pur purposes, so it's a good one to be familiar with. Uh, the third and final one for today is BPO, benzoyl peroxide. And when you heat this up to high temperatures, this oxygen-oxygen bond splits and it generates a radical on each one. So you can use that as radical initiations, and you can also use it for various oxidation reactions as needed. Okay, now let's talk about today's material, E2 reactions. So an E2 reaction is when you have a direct elimination of a leaving group by a base. So you have to usually use a strong base unless you have a very a very acidic proton. And I'll show you a couple examples where, uh, where you can do an elimination with a weak base in a minute. So here, uh, you choose the base depending on what kind of reaction outcome you want. So in this case here, we've used potassium terbutoxide as our base. Now, terbutoxide is a strong base, relatively strong. Um, but what it can do is uh, it can only access the sterically accessible protons for the most part. And so because these ones are on the methyl groups, uh, they're more available. And so we would see an elimination off of this methyl group or the other methyl group. Additionally, like we have a CH2 there. It's just a little bit harder for the terbutoxide to get in there. And so you might see a little bit of elimination product where you have an alkene in that position, uh, but the major product in this case would be this uh, alkene that's at the end, the terminal alkene. So this alkene isn't the most thermodynamically favorable, and so this is a way to get the kinetic product. Uh, this reaction happens faster for the more sterically accessible one. Okay, um, when this occurs, it all occurs simultaneously. So here you can see the terbutoxide is deprotonating the proton and simultaneously the leaving group leaves. Um, in E1 reactions, which we're not talking about today, but we'll talk about in a future video, uh, E1 reactions are done stepwise, but in the case of E2, it's all in one step. 
So if you have a very acidic proton or a leaving group in an activated position, you want to use a milder base because there's no reason to go overkill when you don't need to. When you go overkill, you tend to get side reactions or unexpected reactions. But when you use mild conditions, you tend to get what you expect have happen. Okay, so three bases that you should be familiar with are DBU, uh, DIPAEA, DIPIA. This is also called Hunig's base, H-U-N-I-G, and DBN. And so DBU and DIPIA tend to be the most commonly employed ones, but DBN works sometimes. So if you see someone trying DBU, they might also use DBN. And so the nice thing about these bases is they're organic bases, but they're fairly strong. Like they're mild, but they'll do the job. And so one example would be if you have an activated position such as like an alpha chloro ketone or an alpha bromo ketone, or even if this was a tosylate or a mesylate, that would be okay. Or if you had a beta activated ketone, um, even like an alcohol in that position would work. Um, but in the alpha position, you'd have to have a little bit better of a leaving group. So let's just say you had an alcohol or a mesylate there and you treat it with one of these bases, it'll very easily eliminate and it should afford the trans product as the major product because that's thermodynamically favorable. So uh, conjugated products, conjugation is when you have like double, single, double, or triple, single, triple, or sing triple, single, double, same idea. Uh, those tend to be very stable products and nature wants those to be made. And so what this means is it means it's easier to form those products. Uh, other bases you could use with that are a little bit stronger and more sterically hindered would include lithium diisopropyl amide, LDA, very common base in organic chemistry, uh, lithium HMDS, hexamethyl disilazide, potassium terputoxide, lithium tetramethyl pipridide. And so these are all very commonly encountered. These are only used for elimination when necessary. Terputoxide is pretty much the go-to base, but these other ones could be used if you're struggling for some reason. Let's say that the reaction's just not going with terputoxide at all, then you probably need a slightly stronger base. And so these are stronger bases. While terputanol has a pKa around 15-ish, these all have a pKa more in the realm of 30-ish. And it varies obviously depending on solvent. You might be wondering, could you have the potassium or sodium salts of these? Yes, you could. I've just listed the most common ones. Um, why they're commonly used is a complicated question to answer, but uh, it would be something worth looking into in a future video if there's a lot of interest. So one example of where you'd use a different base would be when you want to when you want to access the thermodynamic product. So in this case, if you use sodium methoxide with this this tertiary bromide, because methoxide's smaller, it can get into that CH, the tertiary CH. It can eliminate and form the the tetra substituted alkene. However, if you were to use terputoxide, terputoxide will only be able to really grab the accessible, sterically accessible protons. And so what you'll actually get is the kinetic uh, alkene, the disubstituted terminal alkene. Um, when we have disubstitution like this, if you recall from an earlier lecture, that's 1,1 one, one disubstituted, which is also called geminally disubstituted. Geminal just means off of the same carbon. Okay, so you would still get small amounts of each product in each case, like the minor products would be the, the blue one in the case of the terputoxide, and the minor product on the right side would be the red red product that you get from terputoxide. So you, you, you'll you usually still see small amounts of other elimination products, but we can usually purify those in the lab if, uh, if they are formed most of the time. So there's much stronger bases though. And so these are the bases that you use when all else fails. This would be like N-butyllithium, sec-butyllithium, terputyllithium, or phenyllithium. The downside is these can do a lot of other chemistry. So these are usually too strong to do elimination reactions. Like they'll do them, don't get me wrong, but they might do other stuff. So one of the things that happens, for instance, is if you have an alkyl iodide, this can just give the lithium to the, to the alkane and it'll rip the iodide off. And so you can end up, instead of deprotonating a proton, you can deiodinate an iodide. And so we call that a halogen exchange. So these can deprotonate not very acidic protons, but they tend to be overkill most of the time. So you'd only really go to these if everything else is failing. Uh, fun fact, you can also enhance the basicity of these by adding in chelator additives that help remove the lithium away from the carbon so that that anion becomes more naked and more uh, strongly reactive. So these are interesting bases, but for the most part, you should use them for other applications. Um, so for practice problems for today's lecture, I'm gonna give you two. Uh, the first one is, 
uh, rationalize a choice of a certain base for this transformation. Uh, additionally, for the next problem, uh, you have to choose a base that would give you this tri-substituted alkene versus the di-substituted alkene, um, and just explain why that is. And maybe if you have any comments on why you think that would be the case, it would be worth like writing that out and thinking about it. And so hopefully this has been a useful lecture on E2 elimination. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. If you have any uh, opinionated comments about how this series could be done better, I'd be happy to hear them in the comments. And I hope you have a great day. Thank you for your time.